We are in a new series today, Counterculture, and today focusing on a loving family. So I would invite you to stand before the reading of God's Word, and if you have your Bibles, turn there with me to John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another." By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the word of God. Would you pray with me? God, I believe that every person here would want to love more. Lord, I pray that you would make us a people to love more, not just ones who strive to love more, but it becomes part of our nature that you would do that in us, God. We pray for the preaching today that you would bless Pastor Trent with courage and boldness and clarity, God, that we might hear the word that you have for us through his mouth today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome once again to Covenant Church. We are starting a new series today, excited to launch this series called Counter Culture. As you know, uh, many Americans are sad today. Many Americans are angry today. In fact, many Americans have been angry for quite some time now. Just this week, hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens made their way to Washington, D.C. because They're angry. They feel like an election has been stolen from them. Some of these folks boiled over into anger to such a level that they actually made their way into the Capitol building, creating great havoc and chaos. But that wasn't the beginning of the anger. No, people were angry before that. You see, a lot of Americans have been angry about this COVID crisis that has been happening for the last almost a year now. They've been angry and upset about government shutdowns and putting small businesses out of work. They've been angry about misinformation and bad information. They've been angry about forced masks and about uh, just the way the world is right now. And others have been angry that governments aren't doing more to shut things down and they're not requiring more things of people and they're not doing more to curb the virus. But this wasn't the beginning of the anger either. Now, many Americans were angry before that. Many Americans were angry over the death of George Floyd and other black Americans at the hands of law enforcement. And, and for many, this anger bubbled over into protests and riots and the destruction of property in many cities across our country, the loss of lives, there has been great anger over that. And and that made a lot of other people really angry at the lack of care for people's personal property and the lack of respect for our law enforcement. And people are really ticked off and angry at what they're seeing on their televisions. And, And many of those who are out marching are even more angry because the people who are watching on their television don't get why they're so angry. The anger didn't even start there. 
But this anger, however it manifests itself and whatever its source, what, what ends up happening is it's, it's becoming increasingly prevalent. It's becoming increasingly noticeable. It's becoming increasingly divisive. And we're seeing the division happen. You've even now got, you got the, the, whereas everybody at least was divided on one social media platform, now you've got people dividing onto multiple social media platforms. And, and rest assured, there will be more divisions yet to follow. And you've got families dividing. You've got friendships dividing over views on, on what's happening out in the world. And we've got an increasing list of things by which a person can be canceled from being an important person in our life. And our list of people that we like is shrinking by the day. And the anger is increasingly bubbling over into violence and scenes like we saw this last week in our nation's capital. And it's all becoming increasingly normal. But brothers and sisters, I want to say to you today that this is not normal. It's not normal for Christians. It's not normal for the church of Jesus Christ. It's not who we are. The church is not to be a reflection of the kingdoms of this world. But rather, we are to be a counterculture reflecting the values of the kingdom of God in the midst of this culture. Or to put it another way, the church is to be the light in the world, not a mirror of the world. And for too long, we have been a mirror looking just like everybody else, acting just like everybody else, talking just like everybody else, feeling just like everybody else, like people who don't know God, like people who don't know that Jesus called you out of darkness. He called you out of the darkness of deceit and dishonesty. He called you out of the darkness of the mob mentality that we see taking place all over our country. He called you out of the darkness of hatred and malice and deceit and bitterness and foolishness. And he called you into his glorious light that you might proclaim his excellencies with your words, with your life, with your love. That's who you are. That's who we are. That's what the church is. Let's remember who we are. We're a community of people who've been called by Jesus to be a counterculture movement, a new humanity in the midst of the ugliness of the world. Don't be surprised at the ugliness of the world. This is, this is normal. But we're to be a counterculture in the midst of it, showing the new thing God is doing in this world. We're to be a community that's marked by love, meaning we put the interests of others ahead of ourselves, or at least we consider the interests of others along with our own. A community that is marked by a complete dependence upon God himself for how we make our way through this world. A community that is marked by a commitment to truth, because there is truth, brothers and sisters. It's not just like everybody's opinion is equally valid. The word of God is truth, and it is still true. And we are people of truth, wherever that truth is found. It's a community of people marked by an ever-deepening transformation by the grace of God at work in our hearts. A community that's marked by the hands of mercy reaching out to any and to all in the name of Jesus. That's what the church is. That's who we are. Or to put it in the words of a statement you're familiar with, we are a loving family, dependent on the Holy Spirit, committed to the word, growing in grace, and reaching out in mercy. 
That's who we are. It's who we're going to be. And it's what we're going to focus on over these next five weeks because I feel like we've had a crisis of identity in our country and in the church. And I want us to remember who we are. And we're going to remember who we are. Jesus in John 13 lays out for his disciples a new commandment. And he says this, a new commandment I give you that you love one another Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know you are my disciples if you love one another. So this is what Jesus has called his disciples to. He wasn't wasting words. This was the end of his life. He was telling us what we need to know and That's what we need to know because that's what the world needs now is love, sweet love. (laughs) It's the only thing that there's just too little of, am I right? (laughs) And so we're going to talk today about the command to love. We're going to talk about a model for love and we're going to talk about an effect of love. So first of all, a command to love one another. It comes in John 13, verse 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now, how could Jesus say this is a new commandment? We know this is not uh, new in terms of it's never been said before exactly. We know that in the book of Leviticus, way back, Leviticus 19, the scripture says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the command to love has been around for a long time. Why does Jesus call this a new commandment? There's probably at least two reasons why. One of them is the particular emphasis in his words here on loving one another, meaning especially the community of believers. He's talking to his disciples and all his disciples ultimately, and he's telling them that the world will know that they're his disciples by how they love one another within the Christian fellowship. And so clearly the Bible does not tell us, not even Jesus, it doesn't tell us that we're to love believers exclusively, but we are to love believers particularly. We are to love believers especially, the Apostle Paul says. Show love to all people, but especially to the household of God. The second new component of Jesus' commandment is that he is now calling them to love one another, not just in a broad, vague sort of a way, but he says, as I have loved you. This is the new thing. Jesus is about to demonstrate an incredible model of love and he says I want you to love one another as I have loved you there is now this new model so when Jesus says love one another as I have loved you he's not saying I want you to feel vaguely positive about the people in your church and even more so I would like you to feel vaguely warm feelings about people in the world and that you see on tv and so on Uh, he's not saying that he's saying I want you to actually Take radical, self-giving action on behalf of people who are made in my image as I have done it for you. That's what he's getting at. Too often we allow our emotions to dictate our love. So we look on the TV and we see people who make us angry, or we get on our social media and we see people who make us angry, and we say to ourselves, I can't love that person. I can't love that person. I can't, rub, I can't love so-and-so. I can't love this person who's in my small group. I can't love this, this person in my shepherding group. I can't, I can't love them because they just, they just rub me the wrong way. Frankly, I don't like them, and I just can't help how I feel. And I want to tell you that that's a lie from the pit of hell intended to steal, kill, and destroy. This is Satan wanting to destroy you, destroy community, destroy the Christian's witness in the world. It's a lie. And Jesus doesn't tell us to feel love. He tells us to love. 
C.S. Lewis is really helpful here in his book, Mere Christianity, when he says, don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. And this is true. When you wait to feel love, to do the actions of love, the reality is you don't ever do the actions of love because you don't feel love. But when you do the actions of love, because the scripture says that we are to do this, then you will oftentimes find as you you do the actions of love that the feelings of love will follow. This is true in marriage. It's almost universal that if somebody comes to you or to me and says, I just don't love them anymore. We've fallen out of Love, we just, it's not there. Invariably, what you will find is they have stopped doing the actions of love. And the feeling followed. And so if you're finding yourself struggling to love your husband, your wife, if you're finding yourself struggling to love your neighbor, then let me encourage you because this is what Jesus says and he doesn't lie. Love them as he has loved you. And just watch and see what happens. Maybe, maybe there won't be a change. That doesn't even matter. We do this ultimately because we love him. We'll love one another. Now, loving people you like is not particularly impressive. You don't get any gold stars. It's a good thing. We should. I mean, it's wonderful. We love the people we like. That's a great thing. I praise God there is love in the world and that people love people that they like. But, but, but you don't have to be born again. You don't need a new nature to love people that you like. There's nothing about that that says there is something different about this person. What makes Christians distinctive or what is supposed to make us distinctive is that we actually love people that we don't like. Again, Lewis writes, the worldly man treats certain people kindly or loves them because he likes them. The Christian trying to treat everyone kindly finds himself liking more and more people as he goes on, including people he could not even have imagined himself liking at the beginning. So the normal way to love in the world is to love the people that you like. The Christian way of loving is to love everybody in the world and to be amazed as you find yourself liking more people. That's the evidence that you're doing the actions of love is that the feelings of like are growing. Now let me ask you a difficult question. Over the past 12 months, would you say that the number of people you're liking is growing or shrinking? If you're like me, and you are, it's probably shrinking. And why is it shrinking? Because people are worse than they've ever been? Nope. People have always been terrible. (laughs) And the thoughts and intentions of their heart are only evil all the time continually. It's why God destroyed everybody with a flood. And it's only by his grace and covenant that he doesn't do so again until the end. So people have always been terrible. So the reason why we're liking fewer people today isn't because people have gotten worse. It's because we've stopped to do the actions. We've stopped doing the actions of love. And we've excused it by saying, but they're really terrible. But they hold this view. But they're so blind. Don't they see that their news source is really dumb? And they, they're, how could I love somebody who's so dumb? Well, Jesus loved us. How could we not love somebody in light of how he's loved us? So this is our call. This is what it means to be the church. It means we love one another inside the church. And that love, though, it's not even contained. I mean, to love believers should just be like, of course. But even that we need to be freshly challenged on. We must love our brothers and sisters in Christ with the actions of love. But that love overflows. And there's more than enough love in the church to overflow into the world. To where the true mark of, of Christians and of a work of grace and a life is that, is that we even love our enemies. This is what we're called to be a counterculture. A culture marked by love. 
What does that look like particularly? Well, let's look at the model that Jesus gives us for loving one another. He says in verse 34, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now, Jesus says these words. We're in about midway through chapter 13 of John. If we were to read from the beginning, you'll remember a familiar story that takes place there. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room. This is the night he's going to be betrayed by Judas, one of his disciples. And while they're eating supper, Jesus takes off his outer garments And he picks up a towel and he wraps it around his waist, looking like a slave. And he fills up a basin with water and he begins to make his way around the table, doing the unthinkable. The very one who holds the world together, through whom all things were made, begins to wash the feet of his disciples. That is not like giving someone a pedicure at the spa today. (laughs) This is demeaning, humiliating. It was the work only a slave was allowed to do. And Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, including the one who would betray him just a short while from then. It's a stunning picture of love in action. And then he says this, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now, there are some churches that believe we actually ought to physically wash one another's feet as a result of this command. I don't think that's what Jesus' intention was. This was particularly culturally located practice. However, what it represents absolutely remains today, and that is that we are to be a people who are marked by the kind of humility that there is no task so low, no service so humble that we would not gladly do it for our brother or sister in Christ. There's nothing that love requires that we would not do for a brother or sister in Christ, including looking like a slave and even acting like one. Now, it actually goes even deeper than this because what Jesus is symbolizing through the washing of feet is not just that he's going to cleanse the manure and dirt and grime that's accumulated on his disciples' feet as they walk through the world, but he's actually going to cleanse them of something far more filthy, in a way far more demeaning and humiliating and shameful. He's going to take their sin our sin upon himself. That's how low, that's how humble, that's how sacrificial Jesus' love is. And yet he would call us and say, as I have done for you, do so for one another. And that's how the world will know that you belong to me because that's how I love. That'll be your distinctive mark out in the world. It won't be your righteous anger, though there's a place for righteous anger. Your distinctive mark will be your humble service of love in action to one another. In this foot washing and in Jesus' teaching and what it ultimately points us to, which is the ministry of the cross, we discover, in the words of one theologian, that the cross is both the way of salvation and the key to community. When Jesus goes to the cross, he goes there to die for our sins, to take them away that that what stands between us and God can be removed and so we can be reconciled to God and be saved. And that's an offer he makes to everyone who will come to him and believe the good news. But when we come to him and we believe the good news at the foot of the cross, something happens there in our heart. Because what we confess when we come to Jesus 
is that there is something so wrong with me, something so corrupted in me, something so backwards and messed up about who I am, that to make it right required the Son of God to be nailed to a tree. That's what it took to fix my problem. How messed up must I be? And when you have that realization, that this is what it took to fix me, and yet he loved me, and he went to that length to do it for me, then, then you begin to, to look around at the people around you, and you say, you know, that, they're actually not all that bad. If I, was so, I was so twisted and broken and messed up and, and rebellious that the, the, the Son of God had to die on a cross for me. That it's hard for me to look down on anybody else. That's exactly what should happen when you understand the message of the cross. Is that you can't look down on anybody. It doesn't mean we can't call right, right and wrong, wrong. And, and we have a, there's a place for that. But it means we do so humbly graciously, with the hope that even as we confront sin in one another, that it, it's not to puff ourselves up, but it's out of love to see your brother or sister be set free. So if Jesus would do this for us, what brothers and sisters is too low, is too humble, is too hard for us to do for one another? If you have to give up drinking wine for the sake of a brother or sister in Christ, is that too far to go? The Apostle Paul would say, no, that's not too far to go. The gospel, would, that's right in line with what the gospel would lead me to do for the sake of my brother. If you had to give up eating meat for the sake of a brother, is that, is that too low? Is that farther than you would go out of love for a brother or sister? Paul says, no way, that's, that's completely in line with where the way the gospel would lead us. If, that's, if that helps my brother or sister, I'd gladly not eat it ever again. That's a man captured by the love of God in Christ on the cross, amen? Think about applications of that today. Let me give you some more practical ways to love one another. The Bible is full of them, of course. In fact, every command of God is ultimately a command that leads us to love him and to love others. Every single one. For to love is to fulfill the law. But let me give you some more specifics. Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. When you honor those around you, when you honor the body of Christ, when you honor your elders and your pastors and your leaders, when you honor anybody, you're demonstrating the love of Jesus in you. Outdo one another, he says, in showing honor. Romans 14, 9, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That's what love looks like in action. It looks like people going out of the way, actually pursuing peace. Not, not looking for new ways to be offended, but actually looking for ways to overcome the things that offend us so that we can have peace with one another. That's what a Christian looks like. And, 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 and we're not doing things to tear one another down, but we're actually thinking about ways that I can practically build up my brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're thinking about ways to help build me up. That's what a, that's what a supportive community of love looks like. We're mutually upbuilding each other, not tearing one another down. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Burdens come in all shapes and sizes. Burdens are sins. Burdens are, are poverty and financial hardship. Burdens are sicknesses. Burdens are grief. Burdens are wayward children. Burdens are small children sometimes when they're sick or difficult or just not getting them. These are the kinds of burdens that Paul says, bear one another's burdens. Don't stand back as part of a loving community and watch people suffering under a load and, and say, I wish it would be better for you. He says, step underneath of the burden and help them carry this. That's what love looks like in action. 
We're not walking around our community and listening to what's going on and, 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 and hoping our eyes don't see a burden. We're actually looking and saying, where are my brothers and sisters laboring? Where are they under a weight of, of pressure or guilt or, or pain? Or grief? And can I step under that with them and help them carry this? Because that's what love does. Ephesians 4, 1. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So you see the words patience and gentleness. These are marks of love. This is, this is how we deal with one another when we love each other is that we're not quick to anger, but we're patient, we're gentle. Even when we have hard things to say, we aim to do so in a way that doesn't hurt but heals. And look, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We have a unity of spirit. We share the Holy Spirit. But are you eager to maintain that unity or are you rather looking for ways in which to break off from your brothers and sisters, separate from them? And are you eager to emphasize those things where you have differences rather than emphasizing those things where you can agree? Ephesians 4.25, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Loving one another means we just tell the truth to each other. We don't lie to one another in a the, in the, in the community of love. We speak the truth, and we speak the truth in love. Even if it means, again, confronting, we speak the truth. We see a brother or sister wayward in trouble and sin. We, we speak the truth in love with the aim of reconciliation, restoration, and so on. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. That's what love looks like in action with the use of our mouths. We don't speak things that corrupt those who hear them, whether it's just because it's sleazy or dirty or because it's deceitful and untrue or because it's intended to provoke rage and make somebody upset and get them disturbed like you're feeling disturbed. We don't let corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but instead what comes out of our mouths is that which is giving grace to those who hear it. I think this is a big one for us, brothers and sisters, because it's not just what we actually say with our mouth, it's actually what we post that's like it's coming out of your mouth. It's what we send to somebody in emails. It's what we, it's, we know, it means we're people who don't gossip, and we most certainly don't slander people. We most certainly don't spread things that are maybe true, they're maybe not, but I thought you should know. It corrupts people. We would never want to corrupt our, those we love. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. If you feel like it. If you're feeling good today. No, no. He says, let all of it be put away from you. There's no place for that in the, in the household of God. There's no place for that in a, in a loving family. Put these things away. All of it. You've been saved from that. That was part of your former darkness. You're part of the light now. There's no place for bitterness in your life anymore. Malice. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's what it looks like, love. Tenderness, it starts in our own families. They're Christians, most of them. It extends beyond there to the household of God and it extends beyond our own local church to Christians wherever we might find them. Colossians 3, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. I, you're probably seeing the commonalities in these things. This is fundamental at the very center of the Christian life. 
This is not advanced Christianity. This is the beginning, it's the middle, it's the end. It's the essence of what it means to be one who knows Jesus, who trusts in him. It's how we live our way in this world. First John 3, 17 and 18, if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. In other words, it's also very practical. If someone has a need and you have the ability to meet it, love meets it. When it's for their good. We know there are situations of codependency and, and where actually meeting someone's need is not meeting their deeper need. But as we're able, we aim to meet the needs of one another. That's what love does. Romans 13, 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love does no wrong. You can ask yourself the question before doing anything, is this in any way wronging my brother or sister? And actually, love goes beyond not doing wrong. Love actually aims to do what is right. It, it aims to what, what builds up, what helps make people whole. That's what love does. And in so doing, as we obey the commandments of God, we are loving God and we're loving our neighbor. That's, that's what it looks like to be a Christian. Those are just a few things. Of course, you can keep reading your Bible and discovering new ways to demonstrate love for others. But I think you get the heart of it. You could look at 1 Corinthians 13 and read there how love is described as, as being patient and it's kind and it's not easily angered. And it doesn't keep records of wrongs and it bears all things. It endures all things. It doesn't give up. It doesn't stop. It doesn't run out. So there are all kinds of descriptions about what love looks like. And I, I want you to imagine, brothers and sisters, a, a, a church like ours where, where love is the pervasive mark of who we are. And I believe in many ways it already is, but I believe that as Paul said, even as you love one another, increase and do so more and more. And imagine a church where, where people come in and there is, they're glad to see one another and it is obvious and apparent. And they're even glad to see people that they don't know because they're delighted in what God might be doing in the life of that person today. And even if they can't shake hands or hug, they're eager to give a warm fist bump or a warm elbow drop or whatever your way of greeting each other is. It's apparent. And, 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 and after the service, they... You know, in ways that are cognizant of people's concerns about COVID, they're eager to, to talk and to, to pray for one another and to tell stories of God's grace and how he's been at work in their lives. And, and, and when we leave this place, we think about one another and we, we're noticing the prayer list and we're praying for people and we're reaching out to those who are in need and, and we're cognizant as we engage in our small groups or, or on Sunday mornings about uh, needs that we might notice in people's lives and we're, we're eager to step in and help bear those burdens where we see them. We notice volunteers and people who are serving and maybe they're always there and maybe they're always there because they love it and maybe they're always there because nobody else will do it. And we say, we maybe just ask them and if that's a burden that we could help to bear, we just, we just gladly step in and help to do it. We're cognizant of, of those who are only able to worship with us online because their health is, is jeopardized, perhaps, and we're thinking about them. And those of you who are just able to worship with us online, you're thinking about others still, and, and you're avoiding falling into that pit of, of despair and self-pity, and you're thinking about, how can I still minister to my brothers and sisters even though I can't be with them in person? Who can I reach out to, send a card to? Who could I pray for and bless? Imagine a community where when you were wrong, you could actually own it and say, I was wrong and I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Imagine a community when you don't even realize that you're wrong, someone loves you enough to come up to you and say, brother, what you're doing is not right. This is what the word says and, and I love you and I, I want you to consider this and I invite you to talk with me about this or the way you treated me wasn't right and, and, and I want you to be right with me and right with God. Imagine where a community where people love each other enough to have those kind of difficult conversations and where when it happens and the person says, and I forgive you. Imagine. That's the church. 
That's not unusual. That's, that's the normal church of brothers and sisters. Let us aim to be that kind of community. What happens as we love one another this way? Let's look. The effect of loving one another. Jesus says, by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. This is how they'll know. The world will watch and they will see and they may even be present among us or they may just hear or they'll see how you engage with the others online or, but they will be watching and they will know you're his disciples by the way you love one another. Doesn't mean they won't still wanna kill you. They killed Jesus, but they'll know that you're one of his because you have the distinctive mark of a person who's been born again and that is that they love sacrificially even their enemies and especially their own family. D.L. Moody said, show me a church where there is love and I will show you a church that is a power in the community. Absolutely right. A church that loves will be a power and a force in their community. I believe that's why Covenant has already had an impact in this community and that stretches beyond this community to the world. But I pray that we will increase in our love for one another and be even more of a power in our community for good. A witness for Jesus here. He went on to tell a story about a little boy who went to a Sunday school class and he was part of a fellowship there and, and his family moved away from that place and, and, um, and it became a lot farther for him to walk to go and be a part of that fellowship. And yet the little boy still decided he was going to walk all the way across town and past numerous other uh, fellowships to be a part of that one. And one of his friends noticed this and said, why are you traveling so far to be a part of that fellowship? And there's plenty of other good churches or fellowships along the way. And the little boy says, yeah, there, there are plenty of good ones, but they're not for me. And the friend said, well, why aren't they for you? And he says, because, because at that place, they really love a fellow. At that place, they really love a fellow. I don't want us to be that church about which people say, at that place, they really love a fellow. Whether he or she looks like us or talks like us, whatever, whoever they are. And everyone who walks into these doors or encounters one of our people, whether we're in this building or outside, that they would say, that covenant church, that's a place, those are a people who really love a fellow. And to not do so, the flip side, to be a church that doesn't love is not to be a church at all. It's like the guy who was, needed dry cleaning and he had waited till the last minute and so he had seen a store across town with a sign that said, one hour dry cleaning. And so he went out of his way to rush over and drop off this dry cleaning there and he drops it off and he says, all right, I need to come back and pick this up in an hour. And the clerk behind the desk says, I can't have this for you till Thursday. And he says, but the sign says, one hour dry cleaning. And the clerk says, yeah, but that's just the sign. We can't actually do it. <laughs> and he's like, what? That's like a church. When people come into church, they say, you don't love one another. We can't just say like, well, yeah, that's just, we just call ourselves a church. We don't actually love each other. A church is a place where there is a family that loves one another. Now, brothers and sisters, I love it. Every time we have a new members class, we ask people, you know, what drew you to covenant? Why are you here? And it is so frequent that we hear the words, oh, I just walked in and it was so warm and it was so friendly. And people reached out to me and they, they came up to me and they talked to me or they introduced me to somebody. It was, it was such a warm place. Now, warm and friendly is not the fullness of love, but it's a great start, brothers and sisters. So let's keep doing that and let's excel at that and let's, let's take it another level as we're able. It's on all of us to be that, that loving family. And the reality is we haven't always done this perfectly and we have failed. I have failed personally. We have failed collectively. Probably all of us could own up to our failures to love one another. And the truth is we're probably gonna fail again. And it stings when I get an email from somebody that says this church was not a loving family to me. And that happens from time to time. 
But here's the good news, brothers and sisters. Even if we fail to be a loving family and we drop the ball personally or collectively, the good news is if we keep the cross of Jesus Christ at the center of this fellowship, we can rest assured that there is grace to cover over our failures to love, but also grace to enable us to repent of it and to begin walking in love once again. The cross is the key. Jesus is the key. His grace is the key. So brothers and sisters, in this world where there is so little love and such a need for love, let us be a countercultural community. Let us be what we say we are, a loving family. And let us actually then love one another. Do you pray with me to that end? We thank you, Lord, that we, though we would have never chosen you, you chose us and you loved us. And now we love because you first loved us. And Lord, may we love because you first loved us. And may it be the distinctive mark of our identity in this world. For any here, Lord, who do not know personally your love, I pray today that you would open their heart to receive the love that you have showered upon us through Jesus and his death on the cross, that they would trust in Jesus and discover the love of God for themselves and find themselves loving and even liking more and more people. We pray this all that the world might know that you are our king. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.